Oh, yeah, sure. <gasps> Learn how to say, would you like fries with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, I think have a I mean, try to get in touch with that true impulse of, of why you want to write and what you want to say. Um, just as a very short anecdote, I happen to be teaching in, in two very different locations: an upscale high school, kind of middle, you know, middle class to upscale high school, and in the basically like the last resort class of North Albion, which is up in North Ontario. Basically, you know, most of these guys, if they didn't pass this class, they, were, they had to leave the school. They were being suspended, and so I happened to be doing that at the same time, and, and so the, the deadlines were close to each other, and you know, from from the kind of up, you know, kind of like the school in the more affluent area, I've got very good scripts. They listen, they follow the format, they follow the rules, and, and I was like, oh, so bored. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> I was really, really, I, I felt like they had nothing to say. And from, from the other class, I, I literally got uh, plays and bits of writing on the back of my, their math paper and things like this. And, and they didn't always talk about their own experiences, but they were speaking of a, of a true voice. They were handwritten, they were raw, they were spelling mistakes, but there were things they wanted to say, and and far more, I saw far more theatrical possibilities um, as plays, just even as writing, from, from those those scraps of paper from, from the from North Etobicoke school than I did from the other school, because because they, they, they were more in touch with their own voices. And they weren't necessarily working to please you. Nope, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> and if we could get those people, like, if we could facilitate <laughs> the writing of those plays, yeah. In a, in a constructive way and get them into the theater, we would get those people and their friends and their family to come to the theater. But there's so little time pay, and attention paid to that. I mean, I come from a very uh, Dickensian background, certainly not theatrical in any way. And I think one of the strengths I had coming in as a playwright was I spoke in a vocabulary that was completely unrelated to the theater. I had no real experience in the theater. I had no understanding of it. What I loved was the medium. And I thought, Wow, this could be a really exciting place if we get rid of these boring fucking plays. <laughs> okay. I, I think I'd add, I, I, I would just reiterate what we've already said at the table. Like, if you're starting your first play, embrace how horrible your writing is. Embrace it, get through it, get it done, get that first draft done. I, that's the, well, the old saying is there's no such thing as a good writer, only a good rewriter. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Scott Gilbert would argue that. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before. Now, um, I am, I, I was being a bit flippant earlier, but for me, because much like Brad, I came from the back, I've never taken a theater course in my life. I'm a member of the Gainesley Uneducated Masses. Mm -hmm. But I woke up, um, my, my start in theater started when Thompson Highway came to me, I, uh, asking me if I wanted to be the writer in residence for Native Earth a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And with my only writing credit having been, and almost completely by accident, one 23-minute episode of The Beachcombers. And he said, would you be a writer in residence? And I said, no. Um, you know, going to school on the reserve and then being bused to nearby Lakefield to go to high school, I had been taught that theater was essentially dead white men. And I didn't know any dead white men, and I didn't speak iambic pentameter. So I said, no. But he... He managed to convince me to do it, taught me it would be a great adventure, and I went, oh, very well, and I went into it. And what I became intrigued with, why I'm still here 25 years later, having, as I said, no knowledge of theater whatsoever, is the ability to play God without being sacrilegious. You create, you make people fall in love, you make people kill each other, you, you create universes, people, environments, and there's very, very seldom you find you see that thrill that you can have in seeing what you create on stage. And it says, through thick and thin, through horror stories and triumphs, I'm still here 25 years later. I have one piece of advice for writers, and, and uh, for playwrights, and, and but uh, for writers in general, and I, I come up against this a lot, particularly when I'm teaching, and it's, it's character is not enough. Fascinating characters are not enough. What's the story? What's the narrative? What are the events that make these people interesting and raise the stakes and make things happen? And this is sort of the last thing even professional playwrights often have considered when they're sitting down to write a play. What is going to hold me here? Because these characters are not going to do it. I want a story. I want A to lead to B to C to D. I want escalating action. I want a plot. 
I don't want just people sitting in a room and talking. That's very nice for about 10 or 15 minutes, but what is the action in the play? And how do you make action dramatic on the stage? And, and I don't think enough people focus on that. And that's the thing I always go back to when I'm working with new or young writers, which is the character's not enough. What's the story? And tell me the story. Don't tell me you have a story. <laughs> tell me the story right now. Pitch it to me, make it interesting, hold my attention. And if you can't do that, you're not ready to write it. Fucks everybody up. Oh. <laughs> So that last question, I was thinking I wouldn't ask it, and then I'm glad I did. So